Jazakallah khair from Brother Yusuf Patel for explaining this to us. Um, I also want to thank al Masjid for allowing us to host this and entertain this discussion to Brother Khalid, to Brother Mubarak who have organized this as well with al Masjid. Um, but just before we do open up for questions, you know, I just want you to realize this point. You know, if I asked you to lend me one million pound, a large sum of money, would you agree with me? Yeah? And then I asked you to lend it to me for a year or two years. Would you lend me that money and not ask me about that money until the end of the two years or one year? Or would you be asking me every single day, what am I doing with your investment? What am I doing with your money? Every week, every month, you'd be asking me, what am I doing with your money? Have I run away with it? The point I'm trying to make, our children are worth far more than one million pound. Yet, when it comes to dropping off our children to the school, to strangers, i.e. teachers that you have never engaged, in, engaged with, you haven't spoken to, you don't know who they are, you don't know what their background is, what their belief is, what their teaching style is, how do they treat your children? And then once a year you ask the teacher, how's my child doing in parents' evening? Would you find that acceptable? And that's the point Brother Yusuf is trying to make. Don't just drop your children off and then at the end of the year to ask, how's my child doing? Because if it's July and you get the parents' report and you say your child has failed, well, what can you do? Nothing. So it's important that you engage with your, child, your, your children's teacher or teachers, the school, frequently. And they have a duty to listen to you. They have a duty to make time for you. Uh, and in fact, as parents, you are stakeholders of the school. The school is accountable to you, not the other way around. For if you take your children out of school, the schools don't exist anymore. They close down. And so they depend upon you. And they depend, they depend upon your children as well. But as Brother Yusuf said, your children are amana. And so it's very important that, you, uh, that we raise our children with the values that are coherent with our belief. And, you know, SRE, like Brother it's one area, but believe me, there are many other areas. So I just want to ask a question. Can anybody give me the definition of nativity? What is the definition of nativity? No, it's about Christmas play, something like this. Yeah, you're getting warm. <laughs> it's about, you know, birth of certain individuals, certain conditions. We know at this time or period, they are celebrating Isa alayhi salam, whereas we believe that Isa alayhi salam is a prophet of Allah, but they believe in something different. And they organize children in a play where somebody has to act out as Mary, and somebody has to act out and so and so different people. And at this moment, all schools across the country are doing this at primary school. And I'm talking not at year five or six, I'm talking about nursery. You're talking about three, four year olds. Nursery. They are doing this. Every single school. So that means your children, our children, are being taught this. And <coughs> you are allowed, even for this, to take your child out of this. But the way they speak to you will be very different. And I'll give you my own example. I come from an educational background. I've been an assistant head teacher, head of year as well. But when my daughter was in school and I said to the school, oh, uh, I don't want my daughter to be involved in Diwali activities. And their response was, no, no, look, you know, a few weeks ago we celebrated Eid and we had a party and we made Eid card. I said, yes, I got the Eid card, thank you very much. So it's just, you know, just play and party. It's not religious, we're not doing RE, it's just play. That's all we're going to be doing. And I said, thank you very much, but uh, I don't want my child to be involved in that. And then you saw a different side. She said, oh, 
We have to be raising our children in a tolerant environment. We need to teach them tolerance. And she became very intimidating. And it's only because I come from an educational background, I know some of the legal issues. And I pulled her up straight away. I said, how dare you insinuate that I am being intolerant? How dare you insinuate that I'm going to be raising my children? I said, do you know who I am? And then I told her who I am. And then I said, don't even tell me what the legal framework is, because I know what the law is. And that's when she backed off. So I said, you need to tell me when you're going to do it, so I will withdraw my child, I'll take my child home. Or, I said, you do the alternative, which is when you're doing these activities, you give my child different activities to do. And I said, you have a duty to do this. You have a duty of care. And they did that. And then I got other parents and I informed them. And together, they did this. But believe me, Muslim children aren't the only ones. Jehovah's Witnesses. They know the law very well. And they protect their children from nativity, from birthday celebrations, from SRE and all of these things. Unfortunately, we Muslims, we need to step up as well. We need to gain that knowledge. We need to be educate ourselves so we can protect our children. Anyway, there's lots more we can talk about, but it's important that we take questions from you. And Yusuf and myself will be able to, inshallah, guide and give you some important tips on how you can do this when you're approaching your school. So do we have any questions that you'd like to ask? You mentioned that uh, SRE is not compulsory. Uh, obviously it's divided in two parts. One is the PSHE, mm -hmm. but also the, the science. Yeah. Are you saying that it's not compulsory for both? Okay. What I'm saying is that for in science, in every aspect of science, they have to attend those, those, those science-based classes. But, you know, the, one, of the, one of the issues is that the, really a lot of things that are taught in, in, in the primary school in science are, are quite, the, the biological issues which are not as contentious as the other issues that can be taught. Um, that, e that reproduction is not taught as, uh, as, uh, as in detailed understanding of how it happens or conception, but as a process. Um, just that it happened to say that people people reproduce. People, uh, mothers have children. Um, uh, the female animals have children, um, um, and plants grow. Yeah. So in, in science, you can't remove your children from these classes. But what I'm actually saying is that this is not really SRE, although it's termed SRE. In science, it's not SRE. It's just some issues which happen to have some similarities to what is taught in SRE. Yeah. But schools will understand it as SRE. Yeah? And that's why they sometimes will try and overteach. When they overteach, we need to question them, pull them up on that, and say, actually, look, the, the science curriculum is very clear around what should be taught, and you're overteaching beyond what should be taught at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. Um, you're actually teaching Key Stage 3, which is actually a secondary school topic. Yeah? So you can't take a children out from science, but you can try and question what they're teaching in science so that they don't overteach beyond what should be taught. Um, yeah. I actually mentioned that to the headmaster of the school at my school. And I said, well, you've got one and you've got another, but they are interlinking. So I said, what is a you know, kid, being a kid, will mm. ask a question, mm. which is slightly going down the PSPG route. Yeah, yeah. And they go, well, we're not to answer it. And I said, okay, well, that's the whole point of us. No. No, actually, you know, the government guidance states very clearly that if you have, if a child asks a question which is considered to be, to go beyond what you're teaching at that stage, you say to the child, thank you for that question, it's a very important question, thank you so much, yeah, I value your, your questioning, but I will discuss that with you at a later stage, yeah, or after class, if you want an answer, we can, we can discuss that, yeah. If the parent is, if the child is not removed from PSHE, then the, then the teacher will say to them, okay, you know, we discussed PSHE this, and go into more detail about that, yeah. So there's no obligation to actually answer every question there and then. It's very clear in the government guidance. I think if you look on the Department of Education website, there is a, a sex relationship education guidance document which, is, which was produced in 2000. That is the most up-to-date guidance document. That's very useful that you can actually look into that and say, yeah, say to the head teacher, look, what about this guidance document? Yeah, if you've got the actual document with you and say, look, what about this? Yeah, schools will not say, no, actually, that you're, you're, that's wrong because it's actually an official document. Schools sometimes play upon 
the fact that they think we are knowledgeable about everything and you've got no knowledge about this area. I've got so many letters after my name. Who are you to question what I do? I don't question your job. Who are you to question my job? But actually, it's their job. You're questioning their job because they're teaching your children. They're your children. Um, so actually, I would, I would urge you to, to actually look at that document. I can send you the, the link for that if you want. Um, it's very important. But also what I want to say is that, you know, I, I missed it out of my presentation very briefly, but if we remove our children from these classes, then we have a responsibility to teach our children these issues in an age-appropriate way in line with Islam. Yeah? So, for example, if we teach, take our children out from the SRE classes, but we don't prepare them for puberty, then we are not doing our job. Yeah? That's important. Yeah? And I say that to Muslim parents all the time. Don't think you take your children out and you're not going to replace it with something else. You have to replace it with something else. Before they become, before they become uh, responsible, uh, before they become uh, balid, then you have a responsibility to prepare them for that. Yeah? The changes in their body. Because that also means that they have to pray salah. Yeah? When they have puberty, they have to start looking after uh, uh, um, their, their, uh, uh, their, their, their cleanliness. Yeah? Uh, they've got to do lots of things to ensure that they're in a fit state to be able to pray salah, to read the Quran. Um, so you can interweave all the issues around puberty with that. Even with the daughters. Yeah? The daughter, when they go through menstruation, the, 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 they have to be given the knowledge of that before it happens. Because that really impacts their life as a Muslim. Yeah? So I think, and also, another thing is that in, our, in this society, our children may ask us questions yeah, that we think are inappropriate. They may try to ask us questions because they've heard someone say something, and they ask you a question around it. Yeah? You have to answer it, but you decide how to answer it. But if you don't answer it, say, Bacha, go away. I don't want to answer this question. Yeah? Then they'll go somewhere else and they'll find the answer. You have to be the ultimate reference point for them throughout their whole life. They can come and ask you anything. And you decide how to answer it in the best way possible. You have to, we have to all be, um, we have to live the values that we want our children to live. I see sometimes parents, they say, I want my children, I don't want my children to follow this culture. But then they, sometimes, they say for example, I don't want my children to swear. But they will swear. Yeah? Children don't care about what you say. They care about what you do. So if you swear, they will swear. If you watch Bollywood films and think this is good, they won't, they won't think there's anything bad with Bollywood films. Yeah? If, if, um, if, we, if we, for example, don't uh, treat our salah as important things, yeah, and we don't pray on time, then what message are we sending our children? Yeah? So we need to live the values we want our children to live. Not by what we say, but by what we do. And we've we also got to ensure that our children are not exposed, uh, we've got to be careful about what our children are being exposed to. We can't put our children into a bubble, we can't uh, protect them from everything. But we can, we, can, we can look into, for example, who their friends are. Yeah? We can look into um, what they do outside of school hours. Yeah? Um, who are, who, who, uh, we can look into what they watch on TV or what they don't watch on TV. Yeah, we can uh, we can we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, filter out uh, the internet, for example. Internet is so dangerous these days, and the number of parents who allow their children to look at the internet unsupervised is amazing. Don't do that. You know, they can look at pornography without even anything. Yeah, <coughs> they can go to any sites, they can watch anything, they can learn anything anything that you don't want them to learn. Yeah, so I think it's very important that we invest these this time into them and teach these issues to our children. Yeah? And we should say to the school, I want to teach this to my children. Yeah? It should be such a thing that when the school starts to teach about puberty and the other children can't start to come and say, look, you know this is going to happen in puberty. Yeah, my parents talked to me about that two years ago. What are you talking about? Yeah? This is new to you. I knew this two years ago. What do you mean? I know that. This is Allah. Allah has created me in such a way that I grow from a child to an adolescent. And now I'm responsible to my creator. Yeah, I know this. What's, what's, what's the big deal? So it's not that they're hearing from other children. They hear from you before they hear from other children. It's very important. Sure. It's a very important point. Um, and I do want to re-emphasize that. What the material they teach, you know, from our point of view, it's got to be age appropriate. Uh, and that's the, that's the crucial thing because they do t teach material that's completely inappropriate. My advice is that, you know, whenever you go to any school that find out first who the head teacher is who the governing body is 
and who your classroom teacher is going to be. Because those are the ultimate people who have an influence within the school. So governing body, the head teacher, and uh, who the teacher is. Because often the case that the people on the governing body are from some local church or councillors who are representing some political parties. And these governing body and the head teacher or the senior management team, they may meet up on Friday night or on a Saturday or Sunday and they have their drinks or meals together where they discuss this. So they're very cosy with each other. And hence, whenever a policy wants to be dis uh, decided and pushed or accepted, they'll straight away accept the governing body because of their close relationship. So it's important that you understand this. Um, uh, and the second thing that, again, I want to re-emphasize, as <coughs> Yusuf said, that it is very crucial that we teach our children first. Whether that's at home, directly from the parent, or in the masjid, from the imam, or somebody yeah, who teaches them before they go to the school, so they are well prepared. They have the tools, they have the concepts, they have the ideas to protect their haya. So, at the age of, you know, at, when they get to a certain age, we start talking to them about ghusl, wudu, and all of these things. You know, la hiya fid deen, there is no shame in the deen. We got to teach our children this. We shouldn't shy away from these things. In many ayahs in the Quran, it talks about this. There's many ahadith as well. So, if Islam teaches it, we need to teach it as well. But again, age appropriate. You don't start talking about X, Y, and Z before A, B, and C. Uh, if the sisters do have any questions, you have, please write them and send them forward, like we have some here. Um, the first question I'm going to read out, and I'd like Brother Yusuf to answer this, is uh, how can we start the process of stopping the SRE education in the school? How can we start the process of stopping the SRE education in school? I think in terms of we need, to, we need to see that, you know, when, when Brother Tawheed mentioned that we need to find out who's in the governing body, actually it's one more step than that. Not we need to find out who in, who's in the governing body, we've got to be in the governing body. Yeah? That's very important. You know, lots of times when there's problems in schools and um, schools implement policies that are completely against the values that we believe in, and then we find out that there are no Muslim governors in that governing body. There may be 80% Muslim children in that school, but not even one Muslim governor. Not even one Muslim governor to say, actually, no, we don't believe in this. We, we can't accept that. A lot of the Muslim parents will be unhappy with that. And they're the majority in the school. Yeah? No, don't do this. This is not acceptable. This policy does not, ex does not include everybody in the school. Yeah? This policy is, is not inclusive. So you, obviously you, you can't say we, uh, this is halal or this is haram on the governing body. But you can talk about inclusivity, yeah? that this, this, this policy is not inclusive. Yeah? And if 80% of the children are Muslim children, then actually they've, that's got, they've got to start looking at that perspective before anything else. So if you're on the governing body, you have a say in a lot of things that happen in the school. Now, if you speak to people like Brother Khalid, he will tell you that it is a headache. I was a governor for five years. It is a headache. You are fighting constant battles in the governing body. Yeah? Sometimes you're banging your head against a brick wall. Yeah? But you know, it, either it's, that, it's either that or the school will do everything and will, will, do, will do much worse. So actually in the governing body, you're sometimes, if you're a lone voice, that is still important. You are going to minimize the dangers in that governing body. Look at Brother Khalid in his school. Yeah? They could have done far worse than they've done. If he hadn't been there yeah, and Allah hadn't supported him in his role as governor, then you, I don't know what would have happened in that school. Yeah? And I've seen schools where there's no Muslim governors and they've done even worse. So the first step to change the SRE policy in the school is to become a governor and to encourage other people to become governors. Some people think you can only be a governor of a school if you're a parent. That is not true. You could be a community governor, somebody who's, for example, a local imam here can say, I want to be the governor of the local school to this, to this masjid. Yeah? Um, or somebody, uh, somebody who's, any one of you who live in a, a local area, say, look, I want to be a community governor. So you apply to the governing body and you say, look, I'm in this, from this background. I want to uh, support the school as a volunteer, as a, vol as, as a community governor. You can also go to the local authority and become a local authority governor. You apply through the local council and become a local authority governor. Or if you've got a parent, if you're a parent of a child in that school, you can become a parent governor uh, by putting yourself up for election with other parents. 
uh, and other parents will vote you in to become a governor. So you represent the interests of, 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 of parents in that school, or you represent the interests of the children in that school, from a parent's perspective. So there's many avenues by which to come into the governing body, but the, the, the real issue is we do not have enough Muslim governors in governing bodies everywhere. It's true. I was speaking to bro a brother, he said, look, in this school, you have people coming from outside of the borough as governors, and they're making decisions about children they probably have never met, and in an area or, a, or a people they've never even been to. There's one governor, I remember, uh, one, one governing body, the, the chair of governors used to, used to work in the city. There's nothing wrong with that. But he's come in his black cab, come to the governing body meeting, and go straight out in his black cab when he finished. He didn't know about the, 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 the culture of the community. He didn't know about the, the area and about the concerns of parents in that area. But he was spending his time in the governing body when most Muslim parents were not bothered. So we've got to change that mentality and become governors in these schools in order to make that change, inshallah. Uh, I remember the potential you mentioned about uh, little information you showed before you actually accepted. In fact, it has happened to Abu Khalid. I used to be Khalid now, that was my teacher growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did show us very little information mm -hmm. what they were teach. And we looked at our services, what is this? Mm -hmm. And then we did actually ask them, is it true what you're going to show us so that you call us for this? Mm. And uh, they said this. So I needed, what I needed to know mm. is any legal framework that was the school just like was. And there's no way we can verify it because our own children have <coughs> gone there. What have you seen? It? Mm. Is it more than this? Did you see only this and this? Mm. So I'm asking if there's any legal way at least to get school, maybe in terms of uh, making a claim about lying to parents and the actual. Yeah. You know, you know, the thing is, is you know, these sort of questions are, are quite difficult because what they say is that you've got to uh, be like almost scrutinizing every single action that a school's doing and verifying whether it's correct or not in that. Um, you know, I think a better strategy would be if we had a lot more governors on the governing body because one role of a governing body is that it has linked governors. Yeah, link governors are responsible for different, uh, different curriculum areas. So you have a link governor for English. And that link governor looks into how English is being taught in the school. Um, they, they go and observe lessons and things like that. Or maths link governor does the same thing. There's also something called SRE link governor. If you have a governor who can actually be an SRE link governor, they can actually go into the class and actually observe how the class is being taught. What materials are being used? Are the materials that they say they're going to use, are they being used? Is the way they said they're going to teach it the way they're teaching it. Because you know, the problem is, you can have a policy, you can have, um, you can have a curriculum, you can have a, a syllabus, you can have lesson plans. But you cannot ever look at the, every single action of that teacher in that school, every single interaction of that teacher with the children. The, te the children might ask a question, and the, 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 the teacher might ask, answer the question in a way which reflects the values that she believes in. So the children ask about something, you know, is, is, you know, I've heard that people, sometimes people have abortions because they don't want children. She said, yeah, you know, a woman has a right to choose. And we don't want, to be, we don't want children to believe that. Yeah? Now, that reflects her values, not the children's values that, 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 that she's teaching. But if you have a link governor who will sit into that class, because, you know, you, in SRE in schools, generally, they will not go on every single, uh, every single week for the whole of the year. Usually it's in a particular term, they'll teach maybe three or four or five uh, lessons that are connected to each other. Yeah? And so it will be that the, the, the link governor can sit in on those classes and observe. And then take those observations to the governing body meeting. Say, look, as a governing body, in our SRE policy, we said that teachers should not answer questions related to abortion in a positive light. They should, they should not be uh, promoting homosexuality and homosexual lifestyles. But the teacher answered the question in this way. So I think we need to talk to that teacher and, and, and say that this is not appropriate, this is not acceptable because we've set the policy. The, the clearer policy, the, the most clear, if you set a clear policy and you go into detail, that restricts what the teachers can teach and how they teach things. And then you have a link governor in that class overseeing and observing things. It's very, that's very important. Yeah. <coughs> so I'm just going to add a comment to that. Um, our children are amana. I don't need to emphasize this anymore. But it all comes down to how much we as an individuals are prepared to invest time. Yeah? And that's crucial. Um, 
I just recently got appointed as a governor again, uh, and it went through a voting or what have you. Um, and so I'm going to be working towards that school and making some differences and some changes because it just happens that that has a majority of Muslims. But ir irrespective of being a governor, as a parent, some of the things that you can do, linked to the previous question of process or stopping SRE education mm. in school, and to your question as well. Well, as a parent, you have a right to know schemes of work. So when you go to the school, remember, it's about educating yourself. It's about knowing key terms or key words, you know, language. And you say, I want to see the schemes of work that you plan <coughs> for this half term or this full term. They may say, oh, we don't normally give this. So, so well, I'd like one. If you don't normally, I'd like one because I have a right to know what you're going to teach my children. And you can say, but I'm looking at it from the point of view that I can support my child. So that's the first thing, ask for the scheme of work. The other thing you can do as a parent is that you are actually even allowed to go to a class, whichever one you want to, to see what is being taught and how it's being taught as well. And that has to come with an arrangement with the school head and the teacher. So you can even actually as a parent go into the class and see what's being taught and how it's being taught. The other thing is that with uh, the material that they're going to use, you can also ask for which organization or which body are you referring or getting your uh, schemes of work or your materials from? Who are you buying from? Uh, and there's different organizations. And you can say, okay. And then you can go to that website and you can see what kind of material it is that they're going to be teaching. Because what they do say to you and what they do in the classroom is two different complete things. Now, I'm a teacher and I can tell you that, yeah? Um, so what they say to parents is one thing and what happens in the classroom is completely different. And sometimes your child won't tell you everything. And your child won't be able to understand <coughs> the process that's been done on them. Because you know, children are very young, they are, they're vulnerable, they don't know. And that's why it's important that, one, we prepare ourselves, but two, we also prepare our children so when they go into the classroom, they can answer back. It's an old example, but it's a famous example where one of the teachers said to a child, or to the classroom in fact, he said, can you see God? If you can't see God, that means he does not exist. And alhamdulillah, we had a child who had uh, intelligence, his parents prepared him, that he said, well, I can't see your brain. Does that mean that your brain don't, you don't have a brain? You know, mm -hmm. he intellectually challenged the teacher to say that not necessarily you have to see things to believe things. And that's the important thing that we invest time, one, educating ourselves, and two, educating our children, that they're well prepared before they enter the classroom. You know, some people say even as an option to send to Islamic schools. Yeah. And it's a big debate as well. But people who have three, four, five children, it's not, it's, then they have to work out from a cost point of view. It's very expensive. So they are un unable to. So you, you go to schools, you ask for the schemes of work, you ask for what the material is going to be used, you ask yourself, say, I want to be in the classroom on that particular lesson. I want you to arrange it, whether it's next week or the week after, whenever. Make that arrangement with the head teachers. That's one of the processes. But yeah, becoming a go governor, it's not very difficult. Local authority governor, parent governor, community governor. And when you become a governor, there's one meeting a term. Or sorry, every half term. So there's about six meetings that you have to attend mm -hmm. in a year, in the evenings. Yeah? And off that is two and a half to three hours a week. But when you become a governor, your local, uh, local authority, educational authority, they give you free training. They give you free training to equip you to become a competent governor. Because obviously you're applying for a new position, you've been appointed, you might not know what to do or how to go about doing it. They will give you the training as well. And once you become a governor, they send you a pack. You read the pack and in that pack it gives you certain dates and times. You book yourself, you get the training, you go in and you become an effective governor. But sometimes it's the case that you as an individual governor, you may not be able to achieve much because they have a vote. And when they have a vote, it's about majority. So it's important that as a Muslim community, like you've gathered here today, that you get together and a majority of you become governors. Or even try to become a chair of governor as well. But if, you, if there aren't positions or available in the school, then even as parents, you form like a lobby and you say as collective parents we don't want this or we want our child to be taught differently you can even go to a, one step further you can say i've seen those materials but these are the materials i want you to give to my child when those sessions are going on you can even go one step further you can even say i tell you what you don't have the resources because they're going to use an excuse they're going to say look we don't have the 
teachers and we don't have the money to do it. It's a typical argument. You know, we, we don't have the provision. Say, no problem, I will come and do it. We say, no problem, my local imam will come and do it. And that's also allowed as well. But they will never tell you that. So, lots of things can be done. Uh, one borough I know, they used to have a local imam who used to go to the school and he used to walk around the corridors and he used to discuss the S subject of SRE being taught. So, it's about, again, you know, educating ourselves and equipping and preparing our children for that. So I hope that answers the questions uh, with regards to the process of stopping SRE. It's not about stopping, it's about protecting our children from it and we as parents educating her and preparing them for the world. And that's what we saw in the Muslim history, you know. Many young people who were commanders, who were leaders, you know, leading the Muslim Ummah because they were prepared. I think this is a comment, but this is, I think this, is, this comment, uh, I won't comment on it myself, but it's actually uh, uh, stresses a very important point. He says, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting and to the point. You have many school governors here, six, and three councillors in the room at present. I would, I would appreciate it if you could stress the point on unity. Also, what you just said, not being sleeping parents or community representatives, I believe that so much can be achieved by being united. It's a very important point. Okay, we've got another question here. Yeah? Comment, yeah. comment um, maybe well, you can maybe add a couple of points here. I was told by one of the teacher who I was having good communication on with, and this is the in speech mark, I am telling or advising you to take your son out of SRE class as we are going, we are going to teach them about masturbation. My son was seven years old at that time. This is the filth that sometimes be taught, unfortunately. Yeah? Just one other point, yeah, you know, because we're in the sanctity of masjid, you know, it's, yeah. The instruments that they actually bring into classrooms, yeah, you know, we didn't bring them in because we're in a masjid. But honestly, if you see the instruments that they bring in, you'll be shocked, you'll be horrified, yeah? They also pay or have voluntary organizations who come into schools and who do the assembly or who do a drama where they're taken out of a lesson. And in there, they do it in a very fun way of how to, you know, where to destroy the haya and the ghair of the Muslim children. Yeah. And uh, I remember the one example where the children, they went home and they said to their parents that, look, this is, here's a letter. Some parents didn't even bother reading the letter. A very few parents went to the school and said, oh, look, we don't want this. And the school said, no, no, you have to. And the parents didn't know what to do. And it's unfortunate, they buried their heads in the sands, which Muslims do not do, bury our heads in the sands. And they said to the child, just close your eyes and don't look. Oh, this is not the response. You know, that I hope that you take away after this presentation, that you bury your head, heads in the sands, or you say, oh, okay, you know, close your eyes and don't look or don't listen. Because that's not going to escape it, nor will you be able to protect your children. And most importantly, yourself in the Akhira as well. There's two questions or two comments that are quite similar. And I think they both mentioned a very important point. One is, can you advise how parents can make collective presentation as most of schools deal with the, 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 deal with the issue individually? So they, don't, they, so they can't change the policy. Or, and the second one is, now we're, um, now we're as, as, as parents, what about, um, we're talking about uh, how to change SRE. Is it not better if all Muslims sign a petition and send to the school to, be, to, to stop this program from primary schools? Both of these uh, points actually stress an important issue that really what you've got to do as, as, as parents who want to try and, and change what's being taught in SRE is work with other parents. Yeah? When you have a couple of parents working in the school to try and make change, it's very difficult for those parents. And, and a school will try and sideline you and say, you are two or three parents. There are 150, 200 parents in the school, but you're only three parents. Why are there more, not, not more parents coming to us and asking us questions and, 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 and complaining about SRE? So I think it's very important that before you take uh, uh, any action against a school, um, that you get parents who believe in the same values together. Even if it is, and it's, it's very important, even if it's getting parents even who are not Muslim, 
getting uh, Christian parents, other, pa other parents from other backgrounds who believe in the same things, that they don't like this SRE, and you work with them together. Yeah? Once you work together with them, uh, you, can, you can build up enough parents to say, actually, we've got a petition signed of 80% um, of, of parents in the school. 80% yeah? of parents who are concerned about the way SRE is being taught. Yeah? And now you at least have a, a basis by which you can go to the school. Now, it doesn't mean that the school will listen to you straight away, but you'll be in a better position to argue your point than if you're an individual parent working on your own. And I've seen lots of parents who will be working on their own for, lots of, lots, for many, many years trying to change SRE. And in the end, they just give up. They say, look, oh, I can't do anything. None of the parents are listening. I'm, I'm just giving up. Yeah? And actually, that's what schools want. Yeah? But the, the main thing, the way to do, make change, change in schools will come slowly, but with persistence. If you are persistent as a parent, you go back to the school again and again about the same point, and you keep raising your concerns with the school, and you organize parents behind you, you're more likely to achieve change in the long run. But schools will try and make it difficult for you so that you give up. Don't give up. Because if you want to fight for your children, there is no way you can give up. Yeah, you continue fighting for them. Imagine if your child had some sort of, uh, by the will of Allah, had some sort of illness uh, or, or disease. Yeah, would you ever think, oh, this is too much, I'm just going to leave it? No. You'll be there at the hospital every week. You'll be making dua to Allah every week. You'll be doing everything in your power to, to save your children. Because that's almost a, 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 a physical uh, a manifestation of danger. But there are also other manifestations of danger that are not, that are not as physical. These are psychological manifestations. They change your, 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 your children's thinking. There are uh, intellectual challenges to your children. They change the way uh, your children views things. Um, these are emotional uh, challenges. They're just as dangerous, and if not, even more dangerous. Because sometimes you can't see the effects of them for years to come. But they're shaping your, ch your children's thinking, shaping their morality, shaping their thoughts, shaping their behavior. So really, persistence is key to this. That is the most important characteristic that we all have to have. Uh, because we believe in, in our children, we, believe, we want our children to grow up with Islamic values. So we have to put the time and effort to achieve that, inshallah. <coughs> I've got a question here. Um, yes, brother at the front. How important is it to basically challenge the things which your child is being taught? Not just in SRE, because obviously that's apparent. But obviously you mentioned, uh, I think the chair mentioned about Christmas. And there's so many other things like evolution. Um, in every subject, because obviously we live in a non-Islamic society, so obviously they're going to propagate their liberal Western culture, which is at odds with our Islamic culture. So how important is it for parents to take an interest in what their children are learning and to provide a counter-narrative to things which contradict the sound? It's not important. It's critical. Yeah? And the reason why I say that, in science, they, uh, they have this thing called the, the boiling frog syndrome. And basically the frog, it, the skin, it climatizes to the environment it's in. So if you had a saucepan with uh, boiling hot water and if you were pl to place a frog in it the frog would jump straight out but if you had cold water you put a frog in there and then you put it on lukewarm either gas and it slowly slowly will heat up what will happen is that eventually the frog will stay and it will die to put that into context is that our children they have haya, they have gay, we, we give them modesty we teach them all of these things, but when they go to school, whether it's SRE, RE, uh, English, science, and many other subjects, assembly, collective worship, they slowly, slowly are deteriorating their haya away from them. And they will come home if you don't get involved, if you don't prepare them, and will come home and say to you, either... I have become something else or they are doing things that you will find unacceptable according to our belief. Just last week, and I think it's about seven, eight days, a Muslim sister, she uh, committed suicide by jumping off a building because her parents were informed of her social network Facebook activities in terms of her parents were being informed what she does, who does she talk to, what kind of communication is she doing, what's her life outside the house. And she felt the pressure and she committed suicide. 
And that's, uh, it's very saddening to hear that. But that's just one example, and there are many more out there. Only last week again, <coughs> it's called sexting, yeah? Where children as young as 13, 14, or even younger, are, ha are being exposed to picture messaging. Where they are sending naked pictures of themselves to each other. And in the report, I was reading an average three to four times in a week, a boy or girl is either sending or asking to be shown the opposite person's uh, uh, you know, body parts. This is how young, and this is what's taking place. So we have to, it's critical, it's not important, it's critical that we protect, but we also educate and prepare ourselves. We, we learn about these things. Uh, otherwise, it will be the case, like I said, you know, like the drip system, slowly, slowly, one in RE, one drip in SRE, in PSHE, in English. You know, in English they teach you, and in RE, that all the religion, in RE they teach you all the religions are the same. Whether you believe in ten gods, you believe in one god, or you believe in no god, you're all the same. How can that be? Does, that just doesn't make sense. In English they tell you there is no absolute truth. You have your opinion, and you have your opinion. And they have to do a play from Shakespeare, part of the curriculum. Whether it's Julia, uh, Romeo and Juliet or Macbeth, whichever one it is. And Romeo and Juliet is obvious one that had to disobey your parents. Because love conquers all, astaghfirullah. Yeah? And Macbeth tells you something else, how to go against your own family. You know, how to backstab. And so and so forth. These are, you know, they're not done, they're, nobody's going to come up to you and say to you, I want you to do this and this is how it's going to happen. And this is what's gonna be, what you're going to become. No. It's an education curriculum. It's, it has a pattern, you know, nursery, take this level away, haya. Reception, another level of haya. Away. And by the time they, you know, they reach secondary, they'll be saying all sorts of things, or they'll be doing all sorts of things that we disapprove of, our belief disapproves of, our, that contradict our values. I hope that answers your question. Um, I've got a question at the back there. Yeah, um, I'm a governor from the local school, North Junior School. And also there's about four, there's about five other governors here in that school as well. Now, some of the parents handed me in a hundred petition signatures saying that they are against uh, SRE. So we handed them in to the head teacher. And so he's organized a consultation SRE meeting where he's going to invite other parents and, count, uh, and governors and also some people from the local authority. And the thing is, um, I'm not quite sure if that's going to work because most of the parents are saying they don't want SRE. And the other thing is I had a discussion with them about this issue of um, that they're teaching secondary school science mm -hmm. in uh, primary schools. So I mentioned the term about reproduction. It mentions, you just need to mention reproduction, not actually fertilization. So the head teacher's reply was, no, reproduction is a big term. It's, it's, a, it's a, you, um, you, need to interpret, you need to have interpretation on it. So he said, look, that's why we talk about fertilization and menstruation and all these other things. Okay, basically, um, this is a very important point, yeah, um, that schools will try and use some of the, 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 the lack of clarity in some of the wording to try and say, actually, we're teaching it within the framework of the national curriculum. But actually, um, we wrote to the... Uh, I, I, was working with the I was working with some Catholics, um, 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 uh, an organisation that um, is opposing SRE as much as Muslims are. And we decided, actually, we, it's best to write to the schools minister. And about six months ago, we wrote to the schools minister. And at the, at the time, it was Nick Gibb, and he replied. And I'll just read it briefly, because this is very important. He said... Um, with reference to your comment about sex education as part of the national curriculum or of primary science, I can confirm that neither the current national curriculum nor the new draft pro program of study requires the naming of internal or external body parts with, with reference to reproduction. The current national curriculum level descriptions and the new draft notes and guidance make clear that this is not included when pupils are taught to name the main body parts in key stage one in year one. Both the current national curriculum and the new draft require pupils to be taught that humans and other animals can produce offsprings which grow into adults. Um, and he said that there's going to be a new draft guidelines around, um, around uh, the science curriculum which will clarify a lot of these issues. Um, 
but it will be actually it will be useful actually to give a copy of this letter to the head teacher um, and to say that actually there's the, 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 if you look at the the, the issue of the the, the, um, the the national curriculum from key stage one key stage two which is primary school and then key stage three key stage four you find that it's graded yeah it starts off by saying uh, children should understand that um, uh, animals, plants, and human beings have the capacity to reproduce. And then it goes on to Key Stage 2, and it, 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 it gives more detail. And in Key Stage 3, even more detail. And it's, it's actually Key Stage 3, Key Stage 4, that it actually introduces the idea of reproduction linked to conception and fertilization. Yeah? And it doesn't do that at the previous levels. Which means that you can't interpret the Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 to include reproduction as part of fertilization and conception because that's not meant to be taught at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. It's meant to be taught at Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. Um, otherwise, then what's the point in having a difference between Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2, Key Stage 3, Key Stage 4? So I think you definitely need to argue the point with them and, and also take that letter with you. Um, uh, I can give you a copy of that letter from the previous um, schools minister who clarified uh, this issue about uh, science curriculum. That reproduction is really just about saying that, that, uh, uh, that plants, animals, human beings can produce offspring which grow into adults. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, so I think definitely challenge that. Uh, and keep, because the thing is, he's got no, 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 uh, 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 he's, he's got no basis for his argument that it can be interpreted in the way that he's interpreting it. I mentioned to him the point about that yeah. the school began in stages. Mm. Stage 1, to stage 2, yeah. to stage 3, they are in stages. Yes. He, he mentioned, before, prior to that point, he mentioned to me, uh, when I was saying, look, uh, we should teach reproduction, he said to me, we don't want to bring it all in one go in, uh, in secondary school. No, that's why in Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2, you're building, you're, building the, you're, you're putting the building block ideas around uh, Around uh, around um, uh, um, um, the growing of a of a seed into a into a, into a plant, which is actually a very good example. Yeah, if you're talking about the grow, uh, the seed grows into a plant, the process is almost a mirror of the human process, but it has different strands to it. Yeah, um, th if you build out building block ideas, then in key stage three and key stage four, then you can introduce other ideas around fertilization, um, and it's not appropriate to teach this at at, at, uh, at primary level. And it was never intended that a science curriculum should teach at that level. So even if he's arguing that you can't teach everything at once, then now he's going away from the curriculum. He's going away into his own, uh, into his own understanding of it. Well, you should take him back to the curriculum and actually say, okay, that's, that's your view. Okay, you have the right to view anything. You can say aliens exist, and we should, that should be taught to children. But that's nothing to do with what we're talking about today. We're talking about the curriculum, and the curriculum has stages. If you want to go beyond the key stage one, if you want to, if you want to teach uh, key stage three, go teach in a secondary school, not in a primary school. This is not meant to be taught in a secondary school. Uh, not, not meant to be taught in a primary school. Come back to the main argument and say don't <coughs> deflect from, from the, that, that real issue. Um, bring it up at that meeting. It's a very important point to, to bring up. And ask the local authority, um, at the education department, um, um, do they believe that this is a correct view? Mm. Um, kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, this is an important point. I mean, <clears throat> the other thing is here that it's very good what you've done in terms of you gathered parents together, done a petition. Uh, the other thing I would suggest to you is send letters in writing as well, yeah, um, and then they have to respond to that as well. So, what they will try to do, because if you say to them, oh, I've got so many other parents behind me, then they say, oh, okay, you are somebody and you have got influence. Uh, I, I can remember on one occasion where one of the parents was unable to speak properly uh, in terms of English language, so I said, look, this parent also wants to withdraw their child. 
and their school responded by, oh, can you come and see us individually after school? Yeah, and this is what they want. Remember, it's, we have to be unified on this and we have to work collectively. So, I have a draft letter I'm happy to share with you. And all you need to do is put your name and address and put the date and what have you, yeah? That you can send where you can say that you want withdrawal of your children, whether it's nativity or all of these other things that you want. And you can change it a little bit as well, yeah? But you've got to work collectively and say... And, and remember, if, if just 10 letters can make a change. And if you've got 100 people, alhamdulillah, you know, it's, mashallah, it's very good. And I think you need to build on that support and you need to work together for this. But, and I think maybe some of the things that we can do uh, after this is sit down and have a proper discussion where either when you arrange one of these meetings, Brother Yusuf or even myself, can, we're happy to go with you as well. Yeah. This point about you know, science is a very important point. Yeah? And a brother mentioned a very important point as well about getting things in written form. Yeah? That is good. You know, when you ask a question about science and, and a te her teacher gave that response, ask him to put that down on paper. Yeah? Ask him to write that down. If he is convinced that that response is acceptable as a correct response, he'll put it down on paper. He won't. I'd, I'd tell you that he won't put it down on paper because it's not the correct response. Yeah. And if if he does that to say, why are you not willing to put that down on paper? If you're not willing to put that down on paper, that means you're not confident that this answer is legally correct. Yeah. Um, and if he answers in that way, then you know that he doesn't understand, or he's trying to. Uh, he's, he's trying to. Um, uh, uh, he's trying to reinterpret or he's giving his own spin on what is a very clear issue. Yeah? So actually ask him before the meeting. I'd like, you know, you, are, you, you made a, a, a remark about the science curriculum. I'd like you to put that down on paper, please. And then you can bring that, bring that to the meeting on, um, uh, when you have that meeting. Um, but I'm, I'm sure he will not put that down in writing. So there was a question at the back yeah, there. My question is... So are you, are you, your, are you a councillor here? I'm a councillor. I've never started okay. saying I'm a councillor plus yes. I'm a, a governor. Yeah, so okay, I'm good. Uh, my question is a little bit different. Okay. Because Assad is a really problematic and controversial issue. Mm. As you mentioned, that uh, Assad for Muslim children should be different. Mm -hmm. That's the one you mentioned. How you differentiate that thing from the other children? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have any strategy policy written down for this is, should be Asari, especially for Muslim children, mm -hmm. for whole Eastern and Baras? Mm -hmm. Because large Muslim communities, all these Baras from uh, Newham and uh, all yes, the yes, forest, yes. us, plus the cover, yeah, yeah, yes. all, all six Baras. Yes. Do you have that? And yes. then you mentioned, the gentleman chair mentioned that over a mom from mosque or some people else can go and give this Asadi lecture. Are they trained to do that? Mm. Do we have some people who can re really go if we mm. influence? We are seven Muslim governors in North Korea. Mm. If we influence them, yes, we want Asadi fair enough, but we want for our Muslim children separately. Mm. So we have trained and educated people mm. who can do that. That's number one. Number two was okay. you mentioned uh, uh, it might hurt sometimes yeah, when yeah. somebody say to you, mm. I'll go, I need to say, go and cut your children out. Mm. Well, on the other hand, if my son or daughter, who is 10, 11 years old, sitting four hours on the internet, 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock, I'm in working somewhere, the wife is doing some other work with the other children and who is looking after that child, what mm -hmm. the child is doing. Even you take the child off of, off from SR in the club mm -hmm. and other children will come and children are very innovative. They ask questions say, what was in the class? Mm -hmm. And they say, we learn about puberty or a part of the body. The child will go home and try to investigate on the computer. Mm -hmm. So automatically that will happen. That message from, like you said here to the parents, it should be given in most small mm. organizations mm. and other places <coughs> where the parents go and do something. Mm. That's for you. Mm. It's like third thing for gentlemen chair. I know you mentioned that you're very uh, educated uh, uh, background people. But I don't like one thing why you mentioned mm. uh, that schools are dependent on us. That's a little bit uh, different from that side. Nowadays, every second child in all communities, especially working, they can't get the place. 
So we cannot give this sort of message to parents, oh, if this teacher don't listen to you, you just to pitch, tell your child home, say we will go to some Muslim school. We can't afford that, please. Mm. We can't do that. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first two, and then you, you can come back on the third one. Um, the, the point you mentioned about SRE resources is a very, very important point. Very, very important point. That for a, I've been thinking about this for the last four years, that we need to come up with some resources that we can use in schools. And I, was, I, I started the process of actually bringing together some resources. But then I actually realised that how is this actually going to be implemented? If we have resources, who's going to deliver them? Yeah? Are people with the different, va different value system to us, the normal teachers in schools, going to deliver this? And how can we ensure that what we intend for them to deliver is exactly what they deliver? It's a very difficult proposition. So actually, I think, um, I've been looking at lots of schools, especially a lot of faith schools. How do they teach SRE? And the best faith schools, the way they do it, is they empower parents to deliver it themselves. I think that is the most, uh, uh, that is the strongest model. Yeah? That's the model we should aspire to, where we get parents to deliver it themselves. Now, some people will say, look, it's not going to happen. But actually, studies have shown if you, if you can uh, equip parents with the support to deliver it themselves, they are more likely to deliver it themselves. They'll have confidence to deliver it themselves. And they realize it's not as difficult as they may think it, they may think it in their minds. Um, I'm actually uh, trying to write a book at the moment, which I want to get published, to, uh, which is a guide. How do you deliver SRE to your children? Yeah? Um, what are the soft skills that you need? What are the practical age-based uh, age um, discussions you need to have? What is that channel of communication? How do you bring strong relationship with your children? How do you ensure that you're the one who the children come to with questions and, uh, and answers, and they don't go on the internet, they don't go to their friends? How could you ensure that that, that exists? So I'm, I'm writing that at the moment, based upon actually research from existing uh, information about. Because I think one thing I was reading is actually those you know, if a, you know, if a father has a strong relationship with his daughter, yeah, she uh, she matures later, she undergoes menstruation later, and this is you know this is amazing. That's how how could that be that? Just a strong relationship, just the presence of the father and a strong relationship of the father with a daughter delays menstruation. Yeah? And that children will prematurely undergo menstruation if their relationship with their father is weak or worse still, their father is absent from their lives. Yeah? And this is actually, this is, this is actually uh, this is research that is that's peer reviewed, that is, um, that is, that, uh, that is, that is not, nobody can question. Um, other issues are around. The, the, the stronger the relationship you have with your children, the less likely they are to engage in early relationships outside of marriage. Yeah, this is very. This is from research in America. Um, the, the 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 more likely that your children adhere to religious practice and attend a religious institution, no matter what that is. So, if a Muslim child, especially boys, if they attend the mosque regularly and they they practice Islam, they're less likely to engage in this behaviour than than children that don't. Yeah. Um, so these sort of things uh, will show parents that it's not rocket science to stop children from engaging in this type of activity, to, to, to enable them to have that knowledge at an earlier age. is not that difficult, but it requires time and effort. Time sometimes is more important than money today. Yeah? You, can buy, you can buy lots of things, yeah? but you can't buy time. And time is the most important thing for your children. Sometimes we think, actually, no, our children, it, the, the actual things that we, we buy them are, are important. The actual, you know, the, the, the toys that we buy them, that they break in a week and they no longer know how, you throw them away. They're important. These are not important. Yeah, children, it's not the toys that you bring or the <coughs> gadgets that they have or the access to the 56-inch plasma screens that they have in their bedrooms and the, the Wi-Fi that they have, all of that. You know, these things don't matter to children. Actually, what children need is time from their parents. And there's lots of research around if parents put in that time with their children, they have, the, they have their more, they're less likely to engage in the type of behavior we see on a Friday night amongst some, even some Muslim children. Um, so all these things, if, 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 what I want to do is actually produce this, publish this book and actually run a training course for parents that can be, uh, that can be, uh, uh, um, that can be delivered to a number of parents who can deliver to other parents and try and change that mentality. Um, now this is a long-term proposition, I agree with you. Yeah? 
But I think this is this is this is the, the this is the main way we're going to get this word out. Not through trying to change the resources in schools, because all you have is diff teachers with different values from yourselves teaching materials which are uh, Islamic materials, but given from their own slant, and that is very dangerous because you can't guarantee that the end product is what you want to be delivered. But your point about the internet is valid. Yeah? This sort of supervision is important. Um, establishing filters on computers is, are important. Making sure that children are not uh, accessing the computer in, uh, in the privacy of their own bedrooms. Making sure they access the internet in, in communal areas. Yeah? Uh, ensuring that you always have that, you're always looking over their shoulder. Yeah? These sort of practical things are absolutely very important. Um, but the most important thing, as I mentioned before, is that when children have questions and concerns, they feel confident that they'll come to you as, your, as their parent and not try and look for the answer elsewhere. And if they're confident in that channel of communication, then they're less likely to go elsewhere. Um, I'll ask Brother Tohi to, 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 um, to comment on that other point about uh, school statehood. Yeah, um, <coughs> Just one point I'll make on the internet before I answer your question. Yeah, um, I actually have been to different schools delivering seminars with regard to uh, internet protection. There's an organisation called CEOP, Child Exploitation Online Protection. They work with police and many other. And I'd run their seminars in different schools. I've done them. And about there's different I've done for children what they need to do, how they can surf the internet, how they can learn from the internet have fun on the internet, but at the same time, stay safe. I've also run a seminar for parents, what they need to do to ensure that their children are roaming the internet in a safe environment. <coughs> and I've also done some teacher training on these issues as well. And one of the points, uh, very important, is that do not allow children to have laptops or computers mm -hmm. in the privacy of their own bedroom. It's a no-go. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you of so many different scenarios or cases mm -hmm. where Children have been groomed, and you know, awful things have taken place. Mm. And it's a big, big uh, worry for not just the Muslims, but children all around the world at this moment. So, it's very important that we have computers with filters, with protection, and they're done in an area where it can be supervised with their parent. So, that's very important. Again, that's, it's, a, it's a big chapter, mm. it's, a, it's a seminar, it's a workshop on its own, yeah, mm. that requires a couple of hours. With regards to uh, the point that you were upset with, I do apologize, I, I had no intention of, 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 my point was, look, children's, schools exist because there are children there, if it's, and I, I've worked in a one borough where some of the schools had to close down because children were not going to that school, and the reason why they were not going to that school was because their track record wasn't that good, they wanted their children to go to different schools, so that school had to close down. You know, so it's a reality. You know, it's like Comet around the corner from it. It's closed down because its sales wasn't happening. People were not buying from it. Woolworths closed down and so on and so forth. <coughs> we as parents, we are stakeholders. Stakeholders means that we have a direct interest or uh, involvement in the school. So we, ha we have a significant role and a position in the school. And, you know, Islamic schools, yeah, is an option. I know it can be very expensive if you've got three, four, five children. It's, you know, you can't do it. So people send them to state schools. But that's, that's not the only option, you know. There are other options. Uh, I, work, I know a family, personally myself. Yeah. The mother herself, uh, she's British born, but she failed her GCSEs herself. She's got three daughters, uh, and all of them, mashallah, one of them is age 13, and she is doing her GCSEs now. The other one is nine years old and she's doing like key stage four work. And you know, I mean, lots of things are possible, but that mother, she's taken the time out to invest in her children. Yeah. There's another thing that parents can do, it's called flexi learning, which is that your children attend certain part of the school and the other part they are home tutored. So what I want to put it in a context is that the schools are accountable to the parents. Yeah? That's the most important point. Uh, and schools are dependent upon the parents. The schools take advantage of the ignorance of the parents, unfortunately. Yeah? And, and that's what hopefully this seminar is to equip you, give you the tools necessary to, for you to protect your children and to challenge. Because at the end of the day, you want your children to, and we want our children to be the best. 
not just academically. You know, if I was to just ask anybody, yeah, what's the purpose of education? Can I have a response? What is the purpose of education? Anyone? Knowledge. Knowledge, yeah. What else? Um, to better yourself. To better yourself, yeah. To better Muslims. Better Muslims, yeah. You know, the definition that I've gathered from the, the history of Islam is to give the necessary knowledge and skills to help the person become successful in life and most importantly in the Akhirah. That's the definition I've kind of like put together, which I, you know, which we are presented in seminars. That's the important thing. But then, you know, secular education, Islamic education, is there a difference? Is there a similarity? What can we do? What can't we do? You know, this is another big workshop on Islam, uh, which um, if, you're, if you, Brother Mubarak or Khalid, the range, Brother Yusuf and myself, we can come again and do a different workshop. One of the workshops that we run, establishing educational priorities for Muslim children. <coughs> Who's going to represent the Muslim children? You know, we need somebody to represent us. One, one other point before I entertain your point is that in London, there was a, a survey done of schools. There are about 1,100 head teachers, of which less than 100 are BME, black and minority ethnics. And the senior leadership team or the senior management team also happen to be those individuals who are not representatives of the community, which means that they are culturally illiterate. And so one of the things that I've been challenging schools is that you've got to be culturally illiterate. And it says, the government policy is that you need to have people who are representative of the community in the school. And what they do do is employ teachers and maybe, maybe middle managers, but never senior management. Because senior managers are the ones who decide the policies for the schools. So it's important, you know, that for uh, those who are, uh, if we have younger brothers or sisters or children who are entering university, you know, I, my own recommendation is to ask them to become teachers. Why? Because this, this profession is the profession of the prophets. You know, to be educators, to be teachers. And teachers, good teachers, are those who preserve the past, reveal the present, and create the future. Thank you very much for that. And that's what I would like to suggest again to you people, mm -hmm. to have some kind of a program schedule that this should be the uh, Asari for Muslim children. Because at this moment, our old Eastern Six Borough, we have more than 100 couplers. Mm. And this is the best time all together. I can take initiative, get all of them together at one mm. place mm. and discuss this matter. Mm. So we can influence now to sort this out. Mm. But if we don't have any material, mm. it's going to be all folk everywhere in all this world just to talk. Mm. So if you do something about that, mm. contact with us and we will do what we can. Sure. The, the curriculum, national curriculum, is all available on the internet. You can download it from the government websites, and even sometimes you can even go to the school websites and they have the policies there as well. You can download them, read them, request them. And one of the things that I'm working <coughs> with uh, uh, some parents is that, look, a, all right, up until that point where curriculum is devised that is uh, age appropriate with the view of the Islamic belief, what do we do until then? It's not we can't do anything. Look, we've we got to look at the national curriculum. We say, what is it that they do need to know? And then as parents, we give it from the Islamic point of view. And Yusuf's point is absolutely fundamental. It starts with the home first. Parents need to be the first ones to do it. Yeah, because like I said, in schools, you don't know who's teaching. And from what point of view? It's three things in schools with, with the classroom teacher. Who's the teacher? What's the material? And how it's going to be taught? And believe me, I recommend that you go to school and you get to know every single teacher personally and then you'll know who you're giving your child to. Because otherwise you're giving your children to strangers. Mm. Yeah? And we don't allow our children to talk to strangers, but we allow our children to be taught by strangers that we don't know. Mm. So there's a comment or a question from the sister at the back. So I, I, I've been advised that I've got to ask the sister first. So yes, sister, you want to make a comment or a question? Okay, so uh, we've got, it's a written comment. On the day of judgment, we as parents, we're going to be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how we looked after the amana, i.e. our children, given to us. 
And no teacher or school is going to be asked or punished. It is us as parents. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair. Is there any... Uh, any yes, brother? Yes. This few years ago, the same school we are talking about, the head teacher, I think, is here. Before, the head teacher was very nice, but the new head teacher, he came and then when he started this SRE, and he started influencing, when I asked why it's need necessary, and that, I think it's too much in his time there, and that's mm. really. Mm. Then he just give, he started to talk, he will start in London bar of Barking and Dagna, highest teenage mm. pregnancy rate. Mm. <laughs> What's to do with us? Mm. <laughs> What's to do with this is good. And that's his trying to convince. And mm. then he exactly what you given the answer he given. Mm. And then he said it's been passed by the governor. And governor was there. Then I said, Do you agree? He was disagree. <laughs> he just agreed. He said, I'm not agree. And now this type of things we are facing, mm. and then again it's been labeled also extremist or they're just uh, um, people they're not uh, uh, integrating with the community. Mm. That type of things we are challenging, and I'm angry with the brother, our councillor, uh, Harry, saying yeah, really okay. we need to have get together and mm. put this point and. That is very important. If we bring something framework mm. or something guideline, this is the guideline. Otherwise, we will talk and nothing will happen. We will fight individually and mm. we, we will and drop by drop our all the identity will change. Mm. And because that someone sent the text and he says even in instead of class making efforts to make other people Muslim, your own children is born to know Muslim mm. and you are accountable for that. Mm. I think that's very important. I think um, what we've got to do is, is say, you know, question this. You know, sometimes people are, hey, by teaching children about SRE in the way that they're teaching it, that they, they think that that's going to stop teenage pregnancies. I would challenge that. Actually, it doesn't. It doesn't, cha it doesn't affect it, yeah? Um, uh, you know, cause, because they don't challenge it. In schools, they're not challenging the behavior which leads to teenage pregnancies. They're not doing that. What they're saying to children is, you decide when, you could, when, you're, when you're ready. Yeah? You decide when you're ready. They're saying to children, you know, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Yeah? You, there's no such thing as good behavior or bad behavior, correct behavior or incorrect behavior. So there's no, no, there's no such thing as this immoral behavior. No. You decide what you do, but if you do decide to do it, then just have condoms. That's what they're doing. In secondary school, really all they're doing is saying, if you want to, go to a clinic and they'll give you your free batch of condoms. That's it. Yeah? So do it in a safe way. But you know, they know, yeah? They said, and then they said condoms is a safe way of stopping teenage pregnancy. First of all, we're encouraging children to engage in, in illicit behavior. But secondly, condoms are not the solution. They don't stop teenage pregnancies and they don't stop TJ, uh, STDs. You know, some, you know these uh, sexually transmitted diseases and infections. Some of these infections are viral infections. And these viral infections are, have no symptoms. Yeah? And especially it affects girls more than boys. In girls, some of the symptoms of uh, chlamydia, for example, will lead to infertility yeah? at a later age. So it won't be, the signs won't be shown then, but when they want to have children in their future, they'll find out, actually, no, you can't. Because your fallopian tubes have been infected to such a degree that you, you know, it's impossible for you to have children now. Yeah, you know, some they said some uh, sexually transmitted diseases never go away. There's no antibiotics you can have that will that will affect it because these are viral infections, not bacterial infections that can have an antibiotic to solve them. But actually, they're viral infections. Some of these infections are lifelong, so you are actually risking your children's health and their life. Yeah, you're risking your children in your school their health and their life based upon incorrect messages you're sending them. But rather, what you should do is say, let's challenge this incorrect behavior. If school said, we're going to challenge this incorrect behavior, every Muslim will be behind them. We'll all be behind them, because that is the correct way to do it. You know, they said that over, over, over 30 years, they've managed to change the behavior of young people around cigarettes. Not because they said to children, you decide whether you have cigarettes or not. If you have cigarettes, you decide, but do it in a way which you don't inhale too deeply, otherwise it will affect you more. No, they said, don't have cigarettes, cigarettes kill. They've had shock campaigns on cigarette packets which say, if you smoke, your lungs will look like this. 
You can get emphysema and that will affect your throat. You will not be able to even breathe from your throat. You have to breathe from a tube. Yeah? They have shock tactics. And they said that these types of uh, campaigns have effective behavior of children. So that now, fewer children are starting to smoke earlier. But when it comes to this type of be other behavior about sexual, sexualization, about sexual behavior, they say it doesn't matter. They say it's not important. We just tell children, give them information, and they make decisions. That is wrong. We say behavior can be affected from all, from all, from all children at all ages, as long as there's the will to do that. So we're saying, if every asks a question, uh, says a question that, you know, by teaching the children about this, it will stop teenage pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections, say to them, give me the evidence for that. How, how, does, how, by, how does the information you're going to provide my child, or any child, prevent them from engaging in this behavior which will lead them to have a life of, of health problems, uh, of, uh, of uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, all of these things. Yeah, there is no correlation, even though they argue there is. Um, really, this is, a, this is, a fab this is a not, not a strong point that they're arguing. I'm just going to make a small comment on that. Um, you know, it's, when we go there, and if they make statements and that you're unsure of, then you've got to ask them, can you show me some evidence? Because say, look, as a parent, say, I can understand what you're saying, but you know, I need some time to think about it, I need to do my own research, can you give me some evidence, can you give me some direction where I can go do research about it? And that's when you'll see they won't provide you anything. If they say to you anything, say, oh, can you give me the policy for that? And be polite about it, be genuine about it, that you're inquiring because you don't know, and you want to know, and you say to them, because... Uh, I was having a discussion with uh, one teacher when I was talking to them about, you know, uh, having these different faith activities and she said to me, oh, uh, it's statutory. And I said, is it really? I said, can you show me where it says it's statutory? Because uh, I said, uh, I've studied the 1996 Act and there's nothing in there that says it's statutory. Mm. And she's like, oh, and I said, so I said, either you're misleading me or you're lying to me, yeah? So I hope you're not doing any of those things. So we've got to be clear, we've got to challenge them on this, yeah? So ask them, can you give us the evidence for this? Um, and then from another point of view, you know, uh, I said to him, I said, look, if you teach a child about at this age when they don't even know the existence of God or all of these things, yeah, and you say to them Diwali or Christmas or Judaism or Hinduism and Islam, all of these things, I said, there's no research at all to indicate that it's going to enhance their learning. Because the whole point of the school is to educate to enhance their learning. And I said, it's important that they have a solid foundation that they have one point of view, and later on in life, when they have the capacity, the reasoning mind, for them to do comparative religion and so on and so forth. But I said, at this age, you're only going to confuse them. And we can see the result of that today. More than 50% of families are born out of wedlock. Over 60 to 70% of children don't even believe in any faith. And I can tell you this much, more than 50% of teachers will say they are either atheist or agnostic. So what are they going to teach your children? Their view of life, their point of view, what they believe in. And they will be able to <coughs> overpower your children in terms of discussion because we haven't prepared or trained our children enough. Which leads on to the point uh, with regards to a question that our sisters asked. Will you be able to confirm, is it true that children are going to be taught about their religion and can visit their place of worship? Is it okay for the Muslim children to visit church or make lamp for Diwali? Two questions. Um, the first one, they in primary and secondary school get taught all religions. You as a parent, you have a right that you don't, if you don't want your children to be taught any other religion, they have to fulfill that responsibility. They will make an excuse to you to say, oh, look, we don't have the provision. Uh, you've got to say, well, the whole point of school is that you have a duty to do it. And the argument I always present to them, and I say, look, if you have one Jewish child whose requirement of dietary is kosher, will you provide it? I say, yeah, we have to, because every child matters. So I said, where you have a percentage of 60% Muslim, you can't provide for them, you have more of a duty of care to those. So, you know, it's all being able to present the arguments in a way that you get them to realize that, look, you need to do this, yeah? So that's from the point of view that when they do teach, you can say to your children, or to the schools that I don't want you to teach my children this. You can even say, look, I don't want you to teach my children Islam. I mean, me, my own personal opinion, I wouldn't want them to teach my children about Islam as well. Because 
If they don't have an understanding of Islam, what are they going to teach? They're going to teach Islam in the same way as they teach any other religion. Meaning, they're all the same. You know? No one is right. It's up to you what you want to believe in. Because me, I don't believe in anything they're going to say. So I wouldn't want to teach that. But again, it's an individual decision for parents to make for that. Um, so, and do they take them to the place of worship? Sometimes they may take to a masjid. But often it's different places of worship, not the masjid. Yeah. Uh, one suggestion I would say to a Lur masjid is to contact the schools and to say to them that if you want to know about Islam, we are happy to come in. Or we are happy for you to bring your children to our masjid to see them. Uh, and then what you do, you, you bring them around, you give them a tour, give them some uh, drinks and refreshments, and you, you answer some of the difficult questions. Yeah? Sometimes it's the case, I mean, it is very difficult. Your point is that, do we have the qualified people to answer those? Yeah, we have, alhamdulillah. We just don't know where they are sometimes, yeah? We just need to approach them, brother Yusuf, myself. And we're not the only ones, there's lots of brothers, yeah? Uh, who are able to do this, to answer these difficult questions. One masjid I know uh, uh, in uh, Redbridge, they have schools not just from the local area, but from abroad, coming to looking at the, the masjid, to finding out. Uh, and sometimes they are happy with the answers that they're given. Sometimes I think they could have been something better. Yeah. So one of the things, as an example, uh, I'm working with many brothers across the country, is this new theme. It's called No Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Because at this moment The picture that's been painted about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Is not a good picture And unfortunately sometimes some of our Muslims We don't portray a good image of what Muslims or Islam should be like So this campaign is all about getting the world to know about who Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was How he came Not for the Arabs Or just for the Muslims وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْآلَمِينَ which means that he came for all mankind. And what he bought as a, as a deen was not just for that time, but for all time, all place, and all people. Which means Muhammad Sallallahu will solve your economic problem. Which means Muhammad Sallallahu will also solve your social problem, your domestic problems, your international problems. Will solve all problems. And you need to know who he was. You need to know who he was. You need to know what his message was. And you need to know what his mission was. So I have a portfolio here of some of the exhibition materials that we have done uh, and I'll pass this around and you're welcome to see this uh, and I'm also working with this in some of the schools that I'll be taking this exhibition about who Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was you know, his timeline also the Islamic civilization, its contribution to life, to society, to the world and also some of the heroes of Islam so as an example, you know uh, uh, in maths, you know, they talk, talk, tell, teach you all of these things. They don't tell you where algebra came from, do they? They don't teach you that. In science, they, talk, they teach you all about who the Western scientist was. What about the Muslim scientists? In fact, you know, as parents, you can even make these suggestions to uh, the schools to say, look, because if you're teaching one, then you should also teach an opposite as well, to give the balanced view and not just one sided view as well. Uh, so I hope the sister I ha I've answered your question. Um, I wouldn't send my child to different places of worship. Uh, it's only going to create confusion at that age. Yeah. Uh, and with the point, uh, yeah. So I hope that's answered the question. Uh, are we should we send our children to different places of worship, uh, or even do activities? No, you're only going to be confusing them. Remember, it it doesn't enhance their learning. It confuses their learning. And we want to enhance our children's learning. Um, inshallah. Any other questions? Oh, so I think we will end there. I just want to quickly say, I've got some things that I want you to take away. Um, a, a report that we produced a few years ago, which um, still contains a lot of information that may be useful for you. Um, some information around that you can give to other parents as well to raise awareness about SRE and my, my contact details as well. Um, we've, I've written to all schools in, in London, all, all primary schools. So if, you, if your children go to a school either in Barking and Dagenham or any other boroughs, um, then please contact me because I should have had a response from that school around what they teach, how they're teaching it, um, and, uh, and some more information around um, uh, key issues around SRE in schools. Um, so please do keep in contact around that, inshallah. Jazakumullah
I want to again thank Alun Masjid, thank Brother Khalid, Brother Mubarak who have uh, arranged this and thank you everybody else for attending uh, and asking your questions. I hope it has been beneficial. I hope what you've, ta what you've gained here, you take this message to the rest of the parents in your community who for whatever reason were unable to attend. Yeah? Um, if I can ask one of the brothers or Brother Mubarak or the Imam to come and end with the dua inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معاصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا أبدا ما أحيتنا وجعله الوارث منا وجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار هي مصيرنا ولا إلى النار هي مصيرنا ولا إلى النار هي مصيرنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يرحمنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اللهم إنا نسألك المغفرة اللهم إنا نسألك المغفرة اللهم إنا نسألك المغفرة ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله وسلم على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين